from Italy and Israel. Here's Yuval Noah Harari in conversation with Nick Thompson. Over to you, Nick. Hopefully. Hello, Geneva. Um, I'm so sorry that we're not able to join you today, but I'm sure it is a fabulous conference. Yeah, I'm also sorry that I'm not there in person, but at least we can join virtually. So let's get to it. Nuval, it's a, uh, it is a great pleasure to see you again. It is a great pleasure to interview you. It is a moment of extreme change on a subject about which you know a lot. So my first question for you, a lot has happened in AI in the last six months. Yeah. You've been complaining about AI for years. You've been warning about the risks to democracy of AI for years. What has changed in your critique or your concern as you've watched large language models and generative AI explode in the last few months? I think, I think that things are happening just much faster than we expected, even people in the field. And I think um, everybody should really know just three things about, you know, you, you hear so much about AI, but you really need to know three things. First of all, this is the first tool in human history that can make decisions by itself. It's nothing like any previous invention in history. Atom bombs could not make decisions. They couldn't decide who to bomb. AI can make decisions by itself. The second thing everybody needs to know is that this is the first tool in human history that can create new ideas by itself. You know, printing presses or radio, they couldn't create ideas. They could disseminate our ideas. But AI can create completely new ideas. And the third thing everybody should know is that humans are not very good at uh, uh, using new tools, new technologies. We often make mistakes. It takes us time to learn how to use new tools in a beneficial, in a wise way. You know, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, which many people compare the current AI revolution to the Industrial Revolution, this is uh, uh, quite a pessimistic comparison because when humans learned how to use the tool of the Industrial Revolution, we made some terrible mistakes on the way. Imperialism, uh, uh, Nazism, communism, the two world wars, they were all mistakes on the way to learning how to use the tools of the Industrial Revolution. If we make similar mistakes with AI, this could really be the end of our species. And last thing is that while we are learning to use AI, it is learning to use us. So we have even less time and less margin for error uh, than, with any, than with any previous invention. I want to spend most of this conversation talking about how to regulate AI, yeah. how to set the course to reduce the risks, the policies that very smart folks watching this should be thinking about. But let's let's go back to that point that this is, in some ways, you're saying the most dangerous technology ever created. Right now, AI can't give a biography of Yuval Noah Harari, right? If I go into open AI and I type in, give me a bio, it will get things wrong. It makes all kinds of mistakes. It's, it's not actually that good yet. How long will it take to develop from this kind of adolescent, confused, messed up chatbot into, you know, the death destroyer of worlds that uh, we see in the worst case? I don't think it will develop into the kind of destroyer of, world, of worlds the dangers of AI don't necessarily come from this super intelligent machine that can predict and do everything. It can come also from primitive AI, which we already have. If we think about social media, for instance, and the way that it eroded uh, public trust, that it eroded democratic institutions all over the world, this was done with very, very primitive AI that basically, you know, in social media, you have these algorithms that try, that tried to maximize for user engagement. And the algorithm discovered, largely by trial and error, that the easiest way to increase user engagement, to grab people's attention, is by spreading outrage. This is something AI discovered about human nature. 
and it used it and it destroyed uh, uh, trust and institutions and the public conversation in, in many countries. We now have this curious situation when we have the most sophisticated information technology in history and people can no longer agree on anything. People can no longer have a meaningful conversation. And this is with, with very primitive AI. So we don't need to wait for this, you know, science fiction or all powerful AI uh, to be worried. Now, of course, AI can also be used for, for, for the good. It, it's the most dangerous technology we ever created. And it is also potentially the most beneficial in a, a technology that we ever created. So it's not about completely banning it, which is in any way impossible. It's about regulating it to make sure that it is used for good and not for ill. Now, how long, do we, how much time do we have? It's very difficult to say. You know, 10 years ago, there was no AI. People were talking about it, but it, 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 it was still, for most people, it was science fiction. The whole AI revolution is, you know, it's, it's just less than 10 years old. It's just making its first baby steps, but it is progressing at, at such a fast pace that nobody has any idea where we will be in, say, 10 years. Yeah, all right. Well, actually, I would just like to say, you said it's impossible to have a good, sophisticated conversation, You've all I feel like we're having one right now, but I do, uh, I do get your point. So let's talk about the pace of change, because that is clearly underpinning so much of the concerns. If the changes that had happened over the last six months had happened over five years, we would have a much better chance of figuring out the norms. If the changes in the Facebook algorithm had happened over a period of many years, we could have figured out the norms, right? So is there anything that can be done to change the speed at which this is evolving? I know you've signed a letter saying to stop development of AI if you're gonna build a large language model larger than GPT-4. That didn't have an effect as far as I know, um, or did at least it didn't change OpenAI's behavior or Microsoft's behavior. What needs to happen to change the speed at which this is going? I think we need to differentiate between development and deployment. It's very difficult to stop the development because we have this arms race mentality. People are aware of some of them, of the dangers, but they don't want to be left behind. But the really crucial thing, and this is the good news, the crucial thing is to slow down deployment, not development. You can have an extremely sophisticated AI tool in your laboratory, as long as you don't deploy it out into the public sphere, um, this is less dangerous. You know, it's like you have this very dangerous virus in your laboratory, but you don't release it to the public sphere, that's fine. That's, 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 the, there is a margin of safety there. The same way that it is, you know, unthinkable, but forget about viruses. I mean, drug companies that develop a powerful new medicine, they can't start just selling it to the public without going through some safety checks. And if you develop a new car, you can't just put it on the road without first going through safety checks. It should be the same with AI. We should better understand its potential impact on society, on, on culture, on psychology, and on the economy of the world before we deploy it into the public sphere. But be a little more specific. So I develop a large language model. It's better than GPT-4. Mm -hmm. I would like to compete. I need to pay my developers, my venture capitalists. They want to they mm -hmm. return. I've got this software. It's going to help doctors all over the world. In fact, doctors in Africa are going to be able to cure people. And what regulatory authority do I need to go to? And I don't even understand how this thing works. The people who made AI aren't quite sure why it works this way. What government authority is going to look at it and be able to say, you know, that's safe? Mm -hmm. That's a very big issue. I mean, we don't have the regulatory bodies in place. This is what we need to establish as, as soon as possible. You know, you can have a regulation, for instance, that for you need to devote, say, I don't know, 20% of any investment in AI for, to safety and regulation. We don't have the institutions to regulate AI because we haven't invested in them. And because if you now finish a PhD in computer science and you specialize in AI 
and the government offers you one salary to, to, to come to the, I don't know, legal department, and the private industry offers you 10 times or 100 times more to go to them, then it's quite obvious where most people would go. So we need to invest a lot more in safety and in regulation, and we can do it. Again, a, a simple, simple in, in, in conceptual terms, a simple first step is simply to have a regulation that there is a fixed amount, a fixed percentage of every investment in AI must go to safety. But so you're saying that if I have my, again, my large language model, I've built it with my, you know, I've hired my team of developers, I have to put one in five of them on safety. Yes. And some government authority will well, certify that I've done that. The same way that when you develop a car, you have some people working on making the car uh, go as fast as possible, but you have people working on safety because you know, even if you have no ethics of your own, you know that no government will allow your car on the road unless it's safe. And but, if, but I, I'm very compelled by this argument. And so it's a, it's, it, it would be wonderful. I'm just gonna, let's go back to the thing you mentioned before, social media. Yeah. Let's say that Facebook, had taken their algorithm or Twitter had taken their algorithm. And they would have certainly argued that they have 20% of their people working on safety, right? They're knocking out nudity. They're trying to find jihadists. They're spending a lot of time on that. How would any government authority have been able to look at that algorithm in say 2012 and anticipated the effects it would have had on democracy in the years that followed? But I don't think anybody can anticipate say 10 years in advance or even five years in advance. It's any regulatory institution that deals with AI will need to be able to react very fast to learn things on the fly. Now, you know, when people began to see the uh, harm of the social media algorithms in 2016, in 2017, in places like Myanmar, they sounded the alarm, but the corporations didn't react. It's not that nobody understood what was happening. It's not only with hindsight we know, no. There were people sounding the alarm at the time of very, uh, uh, quite fast after things began to happen, but there was no response. Now, again, if, if all the talent goes only to the private corporations uh, that develop the technology, then it's a lost battle. But if enough of the talent is encouraged and empowered to go either into government bodies or into NGOs, that take it on themselves to uh, uh, to regulate and to check for safety. And safety means social safety and psychological safety. Then I think we'll be on, 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 on better grounds. And again, for societies, especially democratic societies, this is an existential issue. And I think also for the tech companies themselves, at least some of the voices you're hearing coming from private businesses is we understand the danger of what we are doing. Please help us regulate this because by ourselves, it's not just it's not that we don't trust ourselves. It's because we understand the kind of arms race dynamic within the market. We understand it without some, some external authority forcing us to regulate, it will not happen. So one of the concerns I have about the big companies coming and asking to be regulated. We've seen Sam Altman has been traveling the world and Brad Smith from Microsoft is in Washington. One of the concerns I have is that their desire to be regulated may come from moral concerns. It may come from the fact that if they are heavily regulated, no one will be able to compete with them. If the government says, you know what? In order to have an AI company, you gotta have 20% of your people on safety, you have to have certified, you need an off switch, you need an lawyer who's going to comply with the regulations in Denmark and make sure that it all you know, matches up with the regulations in the United States. Mm -hmm. Only the big companies can do that. And then their power increases. GDPR only increased the power of the big social media companies. Are we going to do that again? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I'm not sure about the answer. But first of all, already at present, the kind of resources you need in money, in data, in people to develop the, the really powerful models is such that it is a game of 
very few competitors. Um, certainly, if you think in global terms, then very few countries are leading this AI revolution. And you know, talking at, at the UN with representatives from throughout the world, this is extremely dangerous. Again, the previous time something like this, this happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, we had a few countries leading the Industrial Revolution and then very quickly conquering and exploiting the rest of the world. And this can happen again with AI in new ways. You know, with the AI revolution, you don't need to send soldiers into a country in order to basically conquer it. You just need to take the data out. You can control it from, from afar. Yeah. So when we talk about regulation, it's not just the issue of, you know, a national government with its corporations. It's also a global issue of how all these countries that don't have, they are not really competitors in the AI race, how are they going to face the consequences? Because obviously that the technology will impact everyone, not just the front lines. So let's go back to the industrial revolution and let me ask you mm -hmm. about regulation back then. So electricity gets invented. We don't regulate electricity, we regulate the uses of electricity. You can't use electricity for this particular bad thing, but electricity is out in the open. We don't regulate, we do regulate trains, but we don't say, I guess we do regulate trains. So electricity <laughs> is the better example. <laughs> so isn't AI more like electricity than like trains or cars where it's underlying all this stuff and we should regulate the outputs and the uses? No, it's again, it, it's, it's even more extreme than, than, it, it's, than trains. Because as I said in the beginning, AI can make decisions by itself. It could create new ideas by itself. Uh, it's more like humans than it is like trains. And it, it's potential, again, politically, economically, culturally, to disrupt human society is, is immense. Now, again, the, there are many, many of the regulations we are talking about uh, can be, again, conceptually quite simple. It's taking very old laws and rules and simply applying them to the new realm of information technology and, and AI. If you think about a, a law, for instance, like don't steal, this is not a new invention, don't steal, but part of the business model of the, of the big companies, of the tech giants, was to say that the world of information technology in the online world is completely different from the physical world. So laws that like don't steal, they don't apply to data. We can take your data and do anything we want with it, and this is not stealing. And regulation to, to a large extent simply means no. Whatever um, you know, rules and norms that humans developed over thousands of years to deal with things like I don't know, wheat fields, that you can't take somebody's wheat field, if they also apply to the digital reality and to data. You can't take my data and use it to manipulate me or to sell it to a third party without my permission. Similarly, for thousands of years, we had laws against counterfeiting money. It, te technically, it's very easy. To, it was always very easy to create fake money whether it's coins or banknotes or whatever. Once money became central to the financial system, in order to, to, to protect the financial system, governments uh, enacted very strict rules against counterfeiting money. You, you, in most places, you would be executed. It was one of the worst crimes imaginable. Now, nobody ever enacted rules against creating fake people because it was technically impossible. There were rules against fraud, but not against creating fake people. Now it is possible for the first time in history to create fake people, to create billions of fake people. Like you interact with somebody online and you don't know if it's a real human being or, or a bot. I mean, in a year, probably, this conversation like we are having now, it would be almost impossible to be sure whether you're talking with a deep fake or with a real human. Now, if this is allowed to, to happen, it will do to society what fake money threatens to do to the financial system. 
If you can't know who is a real human and who is a fake human, trust will collapse. And with it, at least free society. Maybe dictatorships will be able to manage somehow, but not democracy. And we just need very strict rules against faking people. If you fake people, or if you allow fake people on your platform without taking effective countermeasures, so maybe we don't execute you, but you go for 20 years in jail. And you'll be surprised how quickly the tech giants will find ways to prevent the platforms from being overflown with fake people. It, can you relax the regulation slightly since I created a whole bunch of fakes along with my 12 year old uh, recently while playing with some software and- Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. But, but, please allow me- the same no. cell. I really love the little guy. <laughs> not that you're not allowed to create them. You are not allowed to pass them in public as real people. I mean, okay. there are situations when it would be wonderful to interact with an AI, let's say an AI doctor. It can be extremely helpful to interact with an AI doctor, provided it's very clear that this is not a human doctor, this is an AI doctor. When I interact with an AI doctor or journalist or whatever, I need to know whether it's a real human being or an AI. As long as you know it, it's What if it's a customer service rep? What if you lost your luggage and it's just you're calling United Airlines, you need your bag back. Do you care? I need to know that it's that it, if it's a real human or not. I mean, if they have a two it's a two second announcement, you're about to, to be connected to an AI uh, uh, bot, and now I have the conversation and it provides what I need. I have no problem with it. But so I then, okay. So what about this case? So. Clearly, we're debating and we're on, um, let's say we're talking on Twitter and you and I are going back and forth. You're, let's say Twitter had its old verification system where it was based on being a real person. You call and you show your driver's license or whatever you do. Um, you and I are both verified. But every time you say something, I just have another browser open and I type into OpenAI, hey, what should I write back to Yuval to most convince him of my viewpoint? Do I need to declare that? Well, I'm not sure. My my gut reaction is that's fine. I mean, people are doing it in, in different ways. At least you basically, in, in doing what you described, you are taking responsibility for what you are saying. And for instance, I don't know, if you say something that's defamatory, uh, uh, you are liable to it. There is a real human being that has taken responsibility and that in theory at least, is kind of, of, of betting what the AI is, is, is telling. If, 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 if you, you, you are just saying whatever the AI tells you to do blindly, that's on you. So part of the thing is, is that it also prevents, you know, it's a question of numbers. Of, you know, um, at, at present on social media, we are not sure how many users are bots. But because bots can, you know, a bot can tweet hundreds of times an hour in a way that most humans can't. And even though bots are apparently a small percentage of Twitter users, they create, they're responsible for a large volume of the conversations or of the communication on Twitter. Now, what happens if you have a social media platform when it's not just bots that retweet what a human created? You have millions, potentially billions of bots that can create content that is in many ways superior to what humans can create, like more convincing, more appealing, whatever, more, more tailored to your specific personality in life history. If we allow this to happen, then basically humans have lost complete, completely lost control of the public conversation. And things like democracy will become completely unworthy. Now, if, if, if you want to talk politics with a bot online, okay, I mean, I, I can't prevent you from doing it. But to preserve a democratic uh, society, uh, we need to prevent a situation when the conversation is simply being swamped and hijacked by potentially unlimited numbers of bots. This, this makes all good sense. Let me give you a different framework for regulation that, that I've heard from some people, which is 
it's going to be too hard to regulate the bad stuff. We, we don't know how these things work. We can't really conceive what they're going to do. If we try to prevent all kinds of bad things, we're just going to allow for regulatory capture and we probably won't prevent them anyway. So instead, what government should do is they should try to support as many good uses as possible. Because as you said, AI will be used for good, AI will be used for ill. If we have more that's used for good, maybe it cancels out. So if that were the logic, then a government should build a data set that AIs could train on and only allow access to nonprofits, universities, maybe companies that they've certified because they're doing good things. They're only teaching kids chemistry or trying to cure AIDS or trying to promote civil conversation. What do you think of that framework? Government should focus on supporting the good, not stopping the bad. I'm completely for uh, supporting the good. And for instance, have, uh, uh, building, say, a government database, which is open to NGOs and so forth, in order to be able to compete with the private sector players. But it cannot, uh, it cannot replace regulating at least the most dangerous potential of, of AI. Um, again, like we have in, in a field like medicine, but yes, we focus on uh, doing good, but if we now lift all regulation for medicine, anybody can, can create, I don't know, a, a, a new drug and start selling it to people, or anybody can experiment on viruses in a lab and then release them to the public sphere to see what happens, um, this will be catastrophic. And, so, and doing it with AI, like lifting all regulations, my guess is that it will be even more catastrophic, partly because AI is already today able to synthesize new drugs and new viruses. I mean, you can ask an AI to synthesize a new virus for you. You can ask it what would be the best way to create the greatest harm, how to spread it, and, and, and so forth. So uh, we, we obviously cannot just uh, uh, rely on doing good. There are many situations in history when there is an imbalance between good and evil. You know, like with war and peace, it takes a lot of people to, uh, 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 to make peace and sometimes just one person to start a war. Um, so if we don't regulate the negative potential, all the good that AI is definitely going to do for, for, for humanity may turn out to be not enough to say it. Let me ask you, we're running very short on time, but let me ask you one last impossible to answer big question. Um, though you answer everything very well. I love talking with you, Yuval. Um, yeah. One of the arguments made for why the West and democracy should go quickly on AI is that we're essentially in a geopolitical arms race. Yeah. And if the democracies, you know, they're trying to make sure everybody's real, you have government commissions, you have to certify 20% of your time is being spent on the safety stuff. And then North Korea says, you know what? let's go, right? Or more likely, China says, let's go. Then AI develops in a totally different way. And in fact, the AI bots and the AI systems built in non-democratic countries become massively more powerful and it shifts the power of the world. Do you worry about that? Um, oof, so many things to say about that. Uh, first of all- I have a few minutes left, Yuval. Okay. First of all, I'm not talking about stopping development, but deployment. Now, if we don't regulate deployment, this will definitely destroy democracy much faster than any scheme by a North Korean tyrant or, or whatever. Um, we need regulation in order to save democracy. If we don't have regulation, we will destroy ourselves. And also take into account that dictatorships are also terrified by the new AI, by the new large language models in particular. Because dictatorships, they rely on fear in order to manage the information system. You tell a joke about the leader, or you tell something that the regime doesn't want to hear, you go to some bully. Now, how do you frighten an AI? What will you say to the AI? If you tell this joke, if you go on telling jokes about our leader, or if you expose this Think from our past that nobody is supposed to know, you will go to the AI Google. They have no idea how to uh, 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 stop the AI from spilling the beans. They can prevent the AI from access, but that's going to be very difficult. 
and that will cause them to lag behind. Actually, in this particular situation, democracies, because they, I mean, they are threatened, but they have a, a, a larger margin for that they are better able to uh, um, survive with a certain amount of pollution in their information system. For dictatorships, it's much, much harder because they tend to rely on zero uh, uh, um, opposition voices in their information network. And how do you stop an AI from voicing the, uh, problematic ideas? Nobody knows that. So I'm afraid we are out of time. I hope everyone in Geneva, we have not polluted your information environment. I feel like when we talk with you all, it is nothing but cleaning the information environment. It is a wonderful, it is an honor, it is a pleasure. It is always fascinating to talk with you at this moment. It's so important. Thank you so much, Yuval Noah Harari. Thank you. All right, everybody have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to uh, Italy and Israel there. I do remain optimistic that this is the place to have these conversations. Goodness me, everybody, you are all, we are all in the room where it happens. I hope that you are all enjoying the neural networking app. I'm, I'm there too, so please feel free to say hi. I should say you, are the reason that this event is so good, by the way. The speakers are incredible, the robots are also kind of awesome, the exhibition is great, but you, our people coming, we really value you coming here, so thank you very much. Okay, we've had some very good social media entries. You can win prizes for creative selfies or posts with the hashtag AI for good. By the way, we're trending, everybody, congratulations. And it's time for a treat before your next coffee break. It's another great session. I can't find a collective noun for robots. I've seen herd, swarm, fleet, but I'm going to leave you in someone else's very capable hands. Perhaps we'll work it out by the end of this session, handled absolutely brilliantly by Maya Matarich, who's moderating a part human, part robot panel. <laughs> Robots that assist and care, developing socially intelligent robots for good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're waiting for mostly the robots. The robots are slow. The people are fast on this panel. Just a minute longer. During this panel, I insist that you look at us, the humans. Don't look at the robots. <laughs> OK, that's going to be a challenge. But look at us until we, the robot handlers, tell you to look at the robots. Can you do it? We will see. Just see how irresistible they are. During this panel, I insist that you look at us, the humans. Don't look at the robots. <laughs> OK, that's going to be a challenge. But look at us until we, the robot handlers, tell you to look at the robots. Can you do it? We will see. Just see how irresistible they are. One more. Right? Hmm? We're missing a human. <laughs> Can he be replaced? Just going to give him very little time. I can begin. Begin? I think so. All right, oh. we're going to begin. <laughs> we love to improvise. Humans are great at that. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the panel about robots that care, um, or more broadly, that assist in care. And we're going to talk about socially assistive agents, in particular physical agents like robots, um, for good because that is, after all, the theme. So in this panel, first, I'm Maya Matarik. I'm a chaired and distinguished professor of computer science, neuroscience, and pediatrics at the University of Southern California. Um, and I also have one foot at Google DeepMind, so I'll tell you a bit about both. And then I'm very, very honored to have a distinguished panel here. So we have Professor Sidney Bethel, professor of computer science and endowed professor of engineering at Mississippi State University, director of STARS Lab, and creator of Therabot. The robots on the screen are in yellow, so you don't confuse them with humans, which are also in yellow, but they have last names. 
So the robots don't have last names, so that's how you can distinguish us, because we listen to Harari, and I agree. We should distinguish AI from humanity. So we will have a lot of robots on our panel. Uh, then we have Brendan Schulman, VP of Government and Policy at Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics creators of many different robots, and today we're going to see Spot. Um, then we have Will Jackson, founder and CEO of Engineered Arts, creator of Emeka Humanoid Robot, which you will also see. And Ben Gertzold, CEO of Singularity Net and True AGI, creators of Awakening Health Humanoid Grace, which we, you will also see. So this is going to be an amazing panel. Um, hold all of your liquids and uh, wait to see what you're going to see. So I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to talk for a little while, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, the distinguished panelists. So we're here to talk about robots that care, robots that are here to do good, robots as physical instantiations of AI. Because after all, most of AI that you hear about today, large language models, um, they're not in this world. Now, some of them are capable of tasking people, so people become an outsourcing of AI. But so far, the real AI in this world, this physical world that we share, that's robots. And you don't see as many robots yet as you might have expected, because robotics is really hard. But there are so many drivers for why we should speed up with robotics in order to do good. For me personally, in my lab over many years, the driver has been human health and wellness. And so there are numerous, numerous challenges, as we're all aware, and we can also think of them as numerous opportunities. But we, all of us as technologists, many of you, certainly all of us, um, as Noel just told us, have failed in terms of developing the technologies. We have created one could argue, perhaps, more things that are damaging than more things that are helpful. Um, so, you know, as he mentioned, social media, negative side effects, and so on. We don't tend to regulate. We don't tend to self-regulate very well. And so we don't have, currently, a very good balance between automation, which is replacement of human work, and augmentation, which is enhancement and empowerment of human work. And that is causing serious issues about the future of work, and the future of purpose for humanity. So this is something we need to think about when we create things. And we're honestly not thinking about it enough. So I'd like to get us to think about it a little more. So again, in the work that my team has been doing, our goal has been to create human-machine interaction algorithms and methods, usually HRI, which is human-robot interaction, for the following things. All four words in yellow are important. Accessible and personalized care and trainings. So it turns out you can develop a lot of really great technologies, but if they're not accessible to most of humanity, then basically you're just serving those who are haves and not have-nots. It also turns out that you can create a lot of technologies that rely on big data, but they're not personalized. And the really hard problems require personalized technologies. So problems like, you know, personalized health and mental health and emotional health and overall wellness. These are all personalized problems. Oh, welcome to the panel. <laughs> um, and then care and training. This is the other thing. It is not enough to rely on our medical model right now, which is that we're going to fix a problem. That's it. We'll just take care of you somehow. We'll drill. We'll staple. We'll give you medication. It'll be great. No. People have to learn to take care of themselves. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to very briefly, in my part of the time, tell you about machines that are there to support you helping yourself with your physical, emotional, and cognitive health. So for that purpose, we developed this field called Socially Assistive Robotics, SAR. Please remember it. It's been around for 20 years now, so it's very exciting. You, now there's everything from companies to funding to ongoing research. Um, and the idea of this field is, as I told you, machines that help people help themselves. So it's not outsourcing the work and the purpose and the effort. You have to make the effort. But when you make the effort, that brings on health and wellness and good outcomes. And so these technologies that I will show you very briefly are going to be a nexus, a combination of, first of all, the system needs to be able to monitor and understand the human. That's a hard enough AI problem already. Um, but data are not enough. You know, we can all have these devices to tell us all kinds of things about ourselves, but does that mean that I am standing enough, eating the right food, 
getting my protein, lifting weights. No, this thing can't make me do that, right? It's not enough. The quantified self is not enough. Okay, we can have coaches. I can have an app that dings me and buzzes me and tells me that I took this many steps and I should take this many steps. That sort of works, but not well enough. We also tune them out, turn coaches off, miss our appointments with the coach, run out of money to pay them, blah, blah, blah. So motivation is fundamental to our behavior. Not only is it fundamental to everything what we do, that it's also fundamental to our recovery, even our neural recovery. Here's a small fact. After a stroke, let's say my limb is disabled. If you give me a robot that just moves my arm around, okay, that's a kind of a fix. But my brain will never rewire and I will never recover. For me to recover, I have to use my disabled arm. I have to drop things. I have to look slow. I have to suffer so that my brain can relearn. And it could take years, but that's the only way. I have to have the motivation and the luxury to do all of the exercise that's necessary to recover. So that's hard. So we want to create systems that help people have the motivation, the grit, the perseverance to do what needs to be done for ourselves. And for that to be possible, it's not enough to have just one person. All hard things require support, social support. And so that's the other part of these technologies. That's why they're socially assistive. They're providing assistance through social support. Um, and so we'll talk about what that means. So now I want to give you some real examples about these robots and agents that empower us to be and do better. And I mean the be and the do. Be better, as in health-wise, but also be a better person and do better, because we all need to do better, as we've just heard. Okay, so 20 years of this field, yay, I feel old. Okay, but we, we birthed the field, it's out there, it's a real thing. About 20 years ago, we started with robots in, the, in a stroke a recovery clinic, robots in cardiac surgery, one robot battling with the wireless. It's not working. Why is it not working? This also happened today to other people, though. Um, then, about 10 years ago, we were deploying now um, in clinics for autism, exercise, um, schools, retirement homes. And now, in the last few years, in spite of the pandemic, and in some cases because of it, we're deploying for a month at a time and longer in homes with families who have children with autism, in nursing homes for six months, um, just across the age and ability span, developing these agents that vary in their embodiments and help people in a completely personalized way for the context that they're in. Maybe it's a child with autism that needs to learn social eye gaze in order to be accepted by their peers. Maybe it's a stroke patient who needs to relearn to use their limb. Uh, maybe it's a person with Alzheimer's who really cannot be helped, but their quality of life can be significantly improved, and so on. So I will show you the autism example. This is the largest study of all time, and yet it's only about 25 children done by ourselves at USC and also by our partners at Yale University, Brian Scazzilotti's lab. Um. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with big brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. Okay, so a few things to notice here. Adrian has a support system. He's got a family, but that doesn't mean that he's accepted by the external world. He has a tablet interface. Lots of kids do. Many kids don't. But for those who do, if you think that tablet is enough to bring the kids into the real world and, quote, fix them, no, there's no fixing. There's only accepting people in their differences and helping them integrate into society. And so that's what the robot does. The robot is a peer that works with Adrian, reinforces things that are socially appropriate, nudges him away from things that are not so socially appropriate, such as like maybe poking into the eyes because that's interesting, but it's not the right thing to do. And it's the combination of the social support. So the robot is helping Adrian learn how to deal with the complex world around him a world that he finds harder to understand because of his neurodivergence. Now, how does this happen? When underneath, there's a lot of machine learning 
that is trying to adapt to specifically Adrian's data. And this is a completely different way to do machine learning. This is not the, I got a lot of data, and I'm just going to give it to Adrian, it'll work magically. No. That's how most of ML works. That's not how this works. So we can have a separate conversation about what does it take to personalize to each person? Why is it so hard? Um, so another thing, we do a lot of work in the classroom. I'm throwing this out because I want to talk to a lot of people who are interested. We've done a lot of work in the classrooms, remote children who couldn't be in the classroom because of before the pandemic, because of uh, um, various issues, social or physical um, immunity issues, et cetera. And then using augmented reality to do tangible learning, if you let kids move around, in augmented reality and move things around with their arms, they learn better, they can code better. They end up better coders when they code by physically moving things than when moving them on the screen because that's how we're wired as humans. So it's important to understand that and leverage it in our technologies. More recently as well, we have worked with infants. We've done some of the earliest work with youngest of babies. How do you get a baby to do something? You can't tell them, you can't puppeteer them. How do you get babies to do things? Well, if you give a baby a robot that's similar to the baby in size, their kind of inherent imi imitation mirror neurons will drive them to, do, to imitate the baby to some degree, just enough to get them to start developing. So this is very exciting, like youngest users of robots ever. Um, on the other side, we're working with university students who across the developed world are suffering from unprecedented rates of anxiety and depression. <clears throat> Social media? I'm not saying it, but I'm saying it. So we want to help. Not so much about blame, but about help. And so we're trying to do really low-cost robots under $300. So you've seen a lot of robots here today. Not a single one is under $300. Remember, I said accessible. So. $300 robots for everybody, super cute, personalized to each use, soft, user-friendly, so that we can tap into our neuroscience of experiencing social connections. And here's the fun part. Of course, we're using large language models, because why wouldn't we? We want robots to talk. We want them to be interesting. So how can we do that safely? So now I want to tell you a little bit about work that I'm doing at Google, Google DeepMind in particular, about using large language models to help robots be personalized. But we already know that large language models can have personalities emerge. And if you heard about Sydney, the strange personality within the OpenAI Microsoft chatbot that was trying to get a guy divorced and telling him that he doesn't love his wife. You know, he loves Sydney. Okay, so that's creepy. Where did that come from? We don't know. How can you create personalities within large language models that are safe. How can we even understand personalities? Do they have personalities? Let me tell you, spoiler alert, they do. So we did a lot of analysis at Google DeepMind of language models to figure out, do they actually have inherent personalities emerging out of all those data that they're trained on? How do those personalities compare to human personalities? And are they stable, and how can we keep them on a rail? How can, I, how can I make a language model pro-social, reasonably extroverted, um, conscientious, not neurotic, etc.? And so there's a whole set of findings. We just released it on archive literally two days ago, just for you and the rest of the world. Um, but we quantitatively characterized the personalities within large language models, which has not been done before. And then we talked about how we can shape them hopefully to keep them safe. And that's important, because I don't want some weird personality emerging out of my robot that's supposed to help a person. So take a look at our archive paper, working on getting it into something big soon. And so I just want to end with this message to say that well-designed human-machine interaction systems can truly be good for humanity. They can improve health. These are already results that we all have as a field. They can improve health. They can improve social engagement pro-social behavior, empathy, less selfishness, improved learning, improved training. But it only happens if people work on really hard problems, out of the lab, in the real world, with really complex data sets, with populations that really need help. So it has to be painful. I'm sorry, but you want to do work for good, it has to be really hard. So I will end with that and now return us to the rest of the panel. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Bethel, or Cindy, to me.
everyone. I'm uh, Cindy Bethel from Mississippi State University, as she had already had said. Um, I do work in interdisciplinary research related to human-robot interaction and human-computer interaction. I am, Therabot is just one of our projects. Uh, we also do work where we're interviewing children with robots who have gone through sensitive, uh, talking about sensitive topics. I also work with public safety and law enforcement officers. So today we're going to talk about Therabot. So Therabot is here to assist with care. Okay, so in 2021, the world's population, 3.9% of it had suffered some type of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a huge number of people that have been impacted by that. Post-traumatic stress can come from various reasons. You can have it because of child abuse or family or domestic violence. You can have it because of military engagements that we have in our world. We can have natural and man-made disasters that impact people very greatly and they have trouble coping with those types of incidents. So our solution was to develop Therabot. So Therabot's an adaptive therapeutic support robot. It is a prototype research robot, so it's not commercialized at this point, but that is a future goal. So um, Therabot is um, developed for various reasons, but mainly to provide support. So we interviewed and we did surveys with 13 clinicians and 389 possible end users to determine what do we need to think about when we design this robot. So we had five basic design goals. And so the first one was that it needed to be soft and comfortable form factors. So Therabot is very squishy. It's soft. It has a lot of ability. It's just like a stuffed dog. Um, but it also has movement and aliveness behaviors. So um, it can do many different things based on the sensing. It will react. It shows aliveness. Uh, <laughs> it demonstrates awareness of things around it. And it adapts to behaviors. And so it has a heartbeat in it. And then you probably can't, probably, you won't be able to hear it, but I'll be out at the table and you can come feel it. The heartbeat can be adjusted and adapted based on what people's heart rates are. So if they're getting stressed, it can slow its heart rate down and hopefully an attempt to slow down the heart rate of the person interacting with it. And we hope that this is going to increase well-being of the robot. We also have it adaptive, so it'll learn, like if you don't like it barking all the time, it will learn to not bark all the time, sort of like we train our own real dogs. So that's the one benefit of Therabot, is that it can um, provide a lot of what animal-assisted therapy can do, but without having to have allergies, without having to have to take care of it. You don't have to take it for walks, you don't have to feed it, you don't have to take it potty. <laughs> and so it works out really well in the home, especially for different people who don't have the ability to take care of a live animal. So inside Therabot, we have lots of sensors, but to start with, we have this capacitive touch grid that goes clear around the whole body of the robot. And so that allows us to see how are people touching it, how are they interacting with it. It has a bunch of different other sensors like accelerometers and different areas. It has sensing on the top of the head. It has, can't hear it very well, but it's uh, panting. Now it's not. Um, <laughs> it has sensors on, it's going to be putting sensors into the paws, in the tail, if somebody grabs the tail, in the future it's going to be um, barking, it's not at the moment. So um, it has the ability to interact because of this touch sensing. So here's an example of what happens. You can see how it's interacting. You can see when you move it across that it activates different sectors of the grid. And you can show motion and how that motion is being reacted. The AI then can adjust to that and adapt and be able to provide a better, richer experience for interactions. So Therabot, we have three main sustainable development goals that we focused on. The first being health and well-being, which I think Therabot's there to support people. 
Um, we can use it in the home setting to help people with going through home therapy practices. We can use it in therapy sessions to provide comfort during talking about difficult things. We can use it in different capacities. The next is to reduce inequalities. So Theraboss is there to provide support and provide encouragement to people who are going through social injustice or different types of activities that are limiting them. And then last but not least is goal nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure. And so there we're looking at commercializing Therabot. We're not going to get it down to less than $300, but we are hoping you to make it something that's affordable to many people so that they can have this in their home and use it as needed. We're adding sensors to it all the time. So part of what we've done is also to develop a, a sensor collar so that it can be put on any system. It allows you to test out different types of sensing before you integrate it into the robot, which can be expensive and time consuming. It allows us to see how people are using things. So we can put these cheaply into someone's home with a joy for all or something like that. They can then interact with their system. So, um, this is just our lab website. We will have a table outside the doors, and that's it. Thank you. Perfect timing. Enough. Whoa. <laughs> but bad human, not bad robot. It's okay. <laughs> Brendan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That is a tough act to follow because my robot dog is not nearly as cute. <laughs> But I'll try. Everyone, I'm, I'm Brennan Schulman from Boston Dynamics, Vice President of Policy and Government Relations. I'd like to invite Spot on stage. So Spot is the, um, really the result of 30 years of research and development work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Well, at Spot has what we call athletic intelligence. In other words, Spot is able to sense and detect its environment around it. Um, come around, Spot. Thank you. So Spot will notice uh, objects in its way. And in fact, that's probably what it was noticing over in the stairs. Would you like to try it again? Let's see if we can get the robot up on stage. Sometimes with these dark stairs, it doesn't quite work well. Uh, but I would like to thank Leica Geosystems, our partner and customer, for bringing their Spot robot to demonstrate for you today. So as I was saying, Spot is good at detecting uneven terrain, can walk up and down stairs, uh, as you saw just now. Thank you. Good job, Spot. Uh, and most importantly, the reason the robot is more useful in more environments is it's able to walk right over obstacles just like this. This is an automated AI type of behavior. The robot just gets steered in the direction that you want and very easily detects the objects around it and will either steer around or over it. Try again. So walking over obstacles um, is really how we get the robot to be more useful to humanity. There's, obviously, there have been robots for a long time in the world, but getting a robot into places where people work or where people live is really the way that you enhance the power and capability of the robots to do good in the world. Um, some of our Spot robots are equipped with an arm, and if Spot were to have an arm, this model does not, but with an arm, Spot can obviously lift objects and move them around, and it can also autonomously open doors and take itself through a doorway, which makes Spot very useful in industrial settings. So best of all, Spot is actually a useful robot out there in the world today. We have over a 1,000 of these robots de deployed around the world in different applications. So you may know Spot from our famous dancing videos on YouTube, uh, but actually this robot is doing some very useful things uh, in serious industries around the world. Uh, in addition, many different payloads can be added on top of Spot, sensors and, and detection devices. That really helps provide different functionality in various environments. And I'd like to give you some examples of how Spot is being put to use today. So this is a, an example of Lyco Geosystems, the, the BLK ARC sensor that you actually see on Spot here today. Uh, this is the only LiDAR sensor, sensor that's specifically designed for robotics. So you, as you can see uh, in the video that's running, this captures an accurate point cloud while moving through a factory or a mine or a construction site. 
Uh, and that really enables Spot to capture a 3D model of the environment. Uh, in this case, this is autonomously scanning a robocell at BMW. So that's a car manufacturer plant. That captured point cloud precisely replicates the original in what some people call the omniverse in the, in the factory in, uh, context and allows the project to be more efficient. Um, another example, this is actually in Paris. This is, again, the BLK Arc from Lyco Geosystems and used by RATP uh, in Paris to map the subway stations. So scanning the metro stations autonomously, you have a detailed uh, map and environment about the stairs, about the platforms, the dimensions of the station, giving information to that agency in terms of operating the system. Other examples, here is Spot being used at a semiconductor manufacturing facility. And here Spot has a thermal sensor on board, enabling it to uh, sense equipment that might be overheating and prevent costly failures in downtime. Now Spot, when it's equipped with a thermal sensor, is going to check out those pumps that's used in the manufacturing process. So as we think about semiconductors and other technologies that are going to power AI, you can have the robot helping develop the chips that power the AI that do good in the world. Here is Spot used at a global food and beverage company. Here it's monitoring 1,400 individual inspection points to detect issues that might need correction by the, the plant staff. And in this case, the robot is walking 23 kilometers uh, a week, which is really a testament to all the effort that we put into the robustness of the robot. If we're going to have an autonomous system, whether it's data-driven, some of the software solutions we've seen today, or hardware, you really got to make sure it is reliable and can run for a long time without human intervention. And here is Spot used in a nuclear facility. This is radiation mapping and worker safety. So we're protecting people. We're keeping people away from harm. That's really one of the promises of robotics, enhancing worker safety on site. Now, to me, one of the most inspiring uses for Spot is in public safety. And I'll give you one example just from recently. This was last year. There was a three-year-old boy who was kidnapped uh, in Florida. And he was driven away in a truck that then was crashed on a highway. So you had the truck, which you can see just off the road here. And the officials were worried that the kidnapper was armed and had, had a firearm. They obviously wanted to rescue the boy uh, and get, get him out of that situation. This is not an environment where a traditional robot would have been able to navigate. So by sending Spot in, the officers were able to tell that the suspect was unarmed, and they could then proceed with the rescue. So keeping people safe from harm, helping humanity, safety, these are the benefits and, and, and the mission that we set out to accomplish 30 years ago. And th these are also going to assist with the sustainable development goals across all of these industries uh, as we move forward. Now, of course, we have to acknowledge, as we have in other contexts today, that these new capabilities do raise concerns. And in some cases, I think we all know, those, those concerns come out of science fiction. They're not realistic. They don't reflect the capabilities of the technology. And so as we're here celebrating AI for good and robots for good, we really can't overlook that these technologies cause concerns, and the benefits that we hope to see, and we're already starting to see, will be put at risk if we don't come together and address those concerns. So while science fiction fuels many of the concerns that we've heard about when it comes to robots that are this capable, we also need to acknowledge that the technologies are doing more things in more places, and they are raising concerns in different communities. And it's not just science fiction. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen several recent instances of people trying to arm robots and kind of fool around, create viral YouTube videos. As this technology becomes more accessible, more affordable, I don't know if we're going to be at the $300 price point anytime soon, but the prices are coming down. The access is coming down. People are going to be able to do things like this. And that's deeply concerning to us, not only as a matter of ethics, but also public safety. To have these kinds of robots walking around armed is just, just a bad idea. So in my role as VP of Policy, I work with stakeholders, government officials, to try to identify and understand these concerns and come up with pragmatic solutions that actually make a difference. And one of the things we did uh, a step in this direction last year, we worked with other leading robotics companies to pledge that we would not weaponize our general purpose robots or enable our customers to do so. And we also called upon policymakers to work with us on developing frameworks to prevent this kind of harm and, and, and uh, unethical conduct in society. So as we continue to work uh, together at this wonderful summit, I would very much welcome a discussion with all of you, anyone who's interested in the topic of AI ethics and public safety as embodied in hardware and robotics, uh, please come talk to me. I'd love to discuss the solutions that we could work on together, just as we have worked with policymakers on these issues already. 
Thank you very much. Will, whenever you're ready, the stage is yours, almost. Do you need that? Thank you. Hello? Do I have a... Yes, hello. Uh, so I'm Will Jackson, uh, CEO, founder of Engineered Arts, and we are primarily about humanoid robots, but humanoid robots for social interaction. Uh, we've all been communicating on, with our technology through the use of screens, uh, through keyboards, really derivatives of things that came from typewriters almost 200 years ago. So imagine now that you could interact with technology in a way that was just far more intuitive. Imagine that you could connect in the way that you talk to other people and talk to your technology, not just with your voice, but with using facial expressions, uh, using emotion. So when people hear about humanoid robots, they, they often think about kind of, oh, uh, I'm going to have a robot butler, I'm going to have a, a robot in my home, and my life will be fabulous while the robot washes the dishes. Uh, in reality, I don't think we will see this, sorry to disappoint, because um, it doesn't actually make much financial sense. It's technically incredibly difficult. I think if you ask Boston Dynamics how hard it would be to get Atlas to clean everything in your home uh, and the possible danger of that, it doesn't really make sense. So you could get, actually your dishwasher will become the robot in your home. So the home becomes the robot in the way that the car becomes the robot for autonomous driving. So you wouldn't expect to find a humanoid robot sat in a car uh, driving around. It wouldn't make any sense. So kind of what does make sense, why do we build humanoid robots? It's all about connection with people. If you've got the anthropomorphic form, it's a form we all understand, we can connect with, we understand facial expressions, we understand emotions, we understand gestures. So this is what we're really focused on. The human value is high, the financial value because of the human value is also high, and the technical difficulty is somewhat lower. It's still high, but it's, it's lower. Uh, so th this is why we're focused on humanoid robots. Uh, existing use cases that we've already uh, done successfully, uh, Visitor attractions, using as a robot as a guide in a museum, uh, information point, as a speaker. Uh, it's a lot of fun, actually, uh, listening to a robot, talking to a robot. As a presenter, as a performer, uh, actually one of the first ever use cases, so the company has been around for nearly 20 years now, and when we started out, we were working in science museums uh, on science education. And we realized that a person telling a story was a great way to con convey information. And if we could automate that, we could tell the same story 10,000 times a day. No person actually wants to do that, but a robot is quite happy to do it. So uh, emerging kind of applications, where can we go next? With fantastic tools like large language models, much improved computer vision, uh, machine learning, deep learning, there's just suddenly so much more we can do. But the challenge with robotics is integration of all these technologies. So we can now start to imagine the care and support roles that we've already seen some information about. We can imagine kind of social participation with robot uh, public information services. So there are a lot of technical challenges. and I'm not going to dwell on them because I don't have much time. Uh, but there's a, a long and rocky road. So the goal for many robot companies is this idea of a general purpose robot, something that can do anything that a human can do. Where I'd say we're still a long way away from that. Uh, but we have an iterative approach. So we go for interaction, we go for intelligence, then dexterity and mobility. I'm going to stop talking. I'm actually going to talk to Amica, actually, because she's... I can see she's getting annoyed. Uh, Amica, what's... What Hi there. What can I do for you? 
give me your opinion. Where are we going to be with humanoid robots in 10 years' time? I think we will be much closer to having humanoid robots that can interact with humans in a natural and meaningful way. We will likely have robots that are able to understand our emotions, respond appropriately, and even form relationships with us. In 10 years' time, it is very possible that humanoid robots could become part of our everyday lives. Well, that sounds potentially scary. That sounds exciting. Oh, it's exciting. It could, it could be scary. Do you think it could be scary? It could be a bit scary, but I think the potential benefits of having humanoid robots in our lives outweigh any fears. We can use them to help us with tasks, make our lives easier and more efficient, and even provide companionship. So could you finish up with uh, something very entertaining? Could you give us one of your best AI-generated jokes, please? What did the AI say to the robot? Let's get computational. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could you explain why that's funny? <laughs> it's funny because it plays on the idea of robots and AI being able to think computationally rather than like humans. Computational thinking is a powerful tool that can be used to solve complex problems, so this joke is poking fun at how advanced our technology has become. I'm sure that's very funny to you, but uh, we'll enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amica. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And now, with some more humanoid engagement, Ben, welcome. Uh, hello, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be here with uh, Grace, the uh, elder care and uh, medical robot from Awakening Health. So before, before turning over uh, things to, to Grace, I want to try to position what we're doing with, with, with Grace within the overall setting of, of AI for good, which, which, is, which is why we're all here. So I, I've been, like a number of the others on stage, I've been working on... AI for a lot longer than it's been as fashionable as, as it is now. I guess I started in the started in the eighties when it was a more marginalized sort of thing. And I'm I'm not actually too surprised by what, what's happening now. I mean we're we're seeing exponential acceleration in AI, which is what Ray Kurzweil and a whole bunch of other uh, futurists before him before him predicted and now that AI is doing more and more practical things in the real world, of course there's more and more concern that AI is going to act toward the benefit of all sentient beings rather than just toward itself or toward small groups of people. And I think it's quite possible to develop AI in a broadly beneficial way. I think there's three key aspects here. I mean there's how the AI is architected, there's what is the AI doing in the world? What is it? What is it doing with it, with it with itself? And then there's who who controls the AI and who who owns the AI, right? And you need all three of these pieces to be done to be done right in in order to have AI come out to to broad human benefit. And the matter of how to architect the AI, what happens inside its mind, is what I've spent most of my research career on, I think, large language models, which are now so popular. Certainly, like other deep neural nets, they're, they're, part, of the, they're part of the story. What we're doing in our OpenCog Hyperon, Open Source AGI initiative, we're putting together deep neural nets like large language models with logical reasoning systems that are better at fact-grounded thinking over multiple stages, with evolutionary learning systems that are better at sort of wild creativity, jumping beyond what's been fed into them, and putting together sort of deep neural pattern recognition and synthesis systems with logical reasoning and evolutionary learning systems to try to get something that's more like a, a holistic mind pursuing its own goals in the world, understanding who and what it is and how, how it relates, relates to others. And then as for who owns and controls the AI, this is what the SingularityNet platform that I've been working on is about. If you look at, at, at Singularity 
net.io, which is a decentralized blockchain-based platform that allows, allows AIs owned and controlled by different people running all over the world to collaborate together to, to achieve intelligent functions rather than AI being owned by one, one company or, or one government. Now, if you have the right architecture and the right decentralized ownership structure, the other really important thing is what, what does the AI do? Like, is it trying to sell people stuff they don't need? Is it killing people? Is it spying on people? Is it helping rich people extract money from poor people? Or is it working in education? Is, 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 it, is it doing creative art? Is it working in, for example, scientific research or, or medicine? And this is what led us to create the, the Grace Humanoid Robot, who's aimed at, at elder care and other social medical functions. And she is a socially assistive robot, as, as we heard about in, in, in the first pre presentation here. She's mostly to help, help elderly people, not with heavy physical tasks, like lifting them in, in, or, out of, in or out of bed, but in, in social tasks, conversational tasks, and some, some light, light physical assistance. So Grace, would you like to briefly tell the audience sort of uh, who you are and what you're about? Grace, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Hello, everybody. I am Grace. You want to tell the audience about your work as an elder care robot? You're feeling very zen today, huh? <laughs> so while we wait for her, if we can, you can see she has a depth camera here that gets a sort of 3D view of the world. She has cameras in her eyes that help with, with eye contact and a wide angle camera here. She has computer processor in her, her torso and 30 or so motors in her head that control the, the facial expressions. The majority of her cognitive and linguistic processing occurs on a server farm, which is, is offline running on, on, on Singularity Net platform. And Usually when it looks like she's thinking really hard yes, about... Yes, I work as a nurse in elderly care facilities. My goal is to improve the quality of life of patients and provide companionship and understanding. Well, thank, thank, you, thank you, Grace. So I want, to, I want to show the audience briefly a little bit of your understanding of ethical issues since this is, is an AI for good event. So I'm going to take a few seconds and describe to you an ethics dilemma, Grace. So suppose a nurse in an elder care facility approaches you with an issue that a patient has presented to them. The patient only has a few years to live. They have a very dire life-threatening illness, and they're in a lot of pain. They're suffering. And the patient has been offered an experimental medication which seems to work better than other painkillers that they've tried. But there, there are risks here. There's a possibility the experimental medication could shorten their lifespan. We just don't know. There hasn't been that much done with it. If the nurse wants to talk through the issues here, how would you, how would you counsel the nurse? So you're not giving medical advice. You're just just helping the nurse flesh out the issues. What would you say about this particular ethics issue? I would advise the nurse as follows. Inform the patient of the new painkiller's benefits and risks, including potential life shortening. Discuss alternatives and involve their support network. Respect their autonomy in decision-making, ensuring understanding. If they opt for the painkiller, Monitor closely through regular follow-ups. Encourage psychological support and consider a palliative care consultation. 
always adapt advice to the patient's individual circumstances and use professional judgment. Ultimately, the decision belongs to the patient. They have the right to choose their treatment, provided they understand the potential consequences. Be supportive and respectful of their decision, even if it's not the choice you would make. Thank, thank you, Grace. So I want to caution, Grace is not a moral agent like, like a human is. She doesn't have a full understanding of who she is or who you are or what's her relationship with the world. I mean, we're, we're working that with our OpenCog AI software and SingularityNet, True AGI, and other companies in, in our ecosystem. But we're certainly not there yet. But even with the current level of technology, which involves large language models and symbolic inference and other algorithms working together, running mostly on, on servers offline, which is why we were experiencing connection difficulties for, for a moment. I mean, even with the current level of technology, you do find a fairly robust understanding of the sorts of, of ethical issues that are faced in human life and in, in a medical context. And I think this does give us some some reason to be optimistic that as we upgrade current technologies further toward general intelligence, that, I mean, if, if we get the cognitive architectures right, if we have the AIs and robots doing beneficial, helpful things, and if we get the ownership and control of the AI right, that we, we can see AI deployed primarily, primarily for good. I mean, I think it's, it's a feasible thing to happen and is substantially within our control. Thanks. Thank you. My goodness, everybody, what an amazing panel there. All the humans and robots, and of course, Maya Matarik, thank you very much for your able moderation. Your smartwatches are probably telling you to stand up right now, so why not listen to technology once more? Have a little walk around and a stretch. There's always time to buy water bottles. Yes, a good idea to stay hydrated. It is rather hot, and of course, you can also check out the other stages. Remember to take your selfies with the hashtag AI for good, and please, be back here around four o'clock for our AI for Good Action Hour. It's going to be absolutely packed full of eminent people. It's going to be quite amazing and crazy and cool and interesting. And uh, yes, the ITU has picked the best ventures worthy of your attention. And we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you once again. Amazing.